The remedy to a self-centered life is self-forgetfulness. So often we, we find ourselves just preoccupied and focused on like how things affect us. On, you know, if, if I don't look out for me, who else is going to look out for me? And so often we're quick to take offense when somebody does something because we are so focused on how that makes us feel, how that makes, makes us hurt and the pain and all these things. Well, the remedy, the remedy to this kind of behavior in us, the times where we find ourselves drifting, is not to become more focused on our hurt and our pain and, and, and more focused on how to, you know, sort of, sort of power up and defend ourselves. The remedy to these types of things is self-forgetfulness. There is a liberty that you have a freeing thing that takes place in your soul when you allow God to bring you to the place where you actually think about yourself less often. Because in the Christian life, we, we believe that he cares about us and that he takes care of us. That every need that I have, he'll take care of it. And so my time is spent not thinking about everything I need and everything I gotta do and everything that, you know, that is happening to me in this life. The Christian life is, is, is self-forgetfulness. It's this trust that God is in charge and that, and that he, he's never gonna forget about me and he's gonna take care of every need that I have. Hey, we are in week three of a teaching series we've been in called The Freedom of Less. And uh, I've been so excited about uh, just how it's gone so far. I feel like Pastor Josh did a great job of getting us started up until this point. And I'm going to kind of hit cleanup over the next few weeks and just uh, sort of close out this series. Uh, and, and, and I really feel like there's some clear direction from God each, each Sunday. And so excited about today. Uh, next Sunday is going to be like a big one. So um, we're going to talk about the freedom of less hurry and, uh, and what, what it means to embrace Sabbath as resistance to some of the cultural patterns and rhythms in life. And then um, excited the, the last week of this series to talk about uh, dealing with less shame in our life and what God wants to do there. So uh, today I want to just uh, start with the title, The Freedom of Less. And when you look at a title like this, uh, there can be immediately just some mystery, right? There can be a little bit of ambiguity. You can be going like, man, guys, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to communicate through uh, a, a title like this? And, and so what I want to do is just start here and sort of break it down for a second. So, so freedom is essentially when you are no longer held back, right? Uh, freedom is when you have become uncaged, so to speak. So all of us sort of have different maybe pictures or ideas of what it means to be imprisoned or to be caged or to be free, you know, a lot of us, immediately in our minds, we start to think of those who are incarcerated, those who are uh, behind bars, and, and so we know what it means to be sort of locked up or encaged, and then we know freedom is essentially when they are released from behind those bars, and, 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 uh, and now they're able to, to kind of live life. In my experience as a pastor, and, you know, there's, there's been, you know, years of experiencing this, what I have noticed is that there are all kinds of different forms of captivity that people deal with. I mean, I, I've, I've worked with people, I, I've, I've helped people who seem to be emotionally in bondage, people who seem to be really bound up on an emotional level. They're, they're clearly not free in any way, shape, or form. I've worked and met with a lot of people who are uh, really locked up and, and caged up on a spiritual level, and, uh, and it's, it's heartbreaking, and you're trying to work with them to kind of break through some of the things that are holding them back. And so I just, I just believe that, that uh, many of us here today could potentially be unaware of the many different ways we're actually being held back on a spiritual level. I think that there are some of us in here today who, who could be completely unaware of some of the ways we are being held back or, or caged, encaged, so to speak, on a spiritual level. And so this series really speaks to this idea that there is, that there is freedom, there is liberty, right? That, that, that there is, there is a, a freeing that happens in the less, and, and so we live in a world that preoccupies itself with the accumulation of things and living lives that have absolutely zero margin whatsoever. And so I just kind of wonder if it's possible that less really is more. I wonder if it's possible that, that addition really does come through subtraction. And so these are some of the ideas that I want us to sort of hone in on and, and zero in on here today as we sort of collectively come together as a church to 
to sort of reject cultural rhythms and cultural norms and to reorient our lives today around Jesus. Amen? And so these two ideas of, of you know, less is more and that addition really can come through subtraction is, are kind of the idea that, that I, want, I want us to continue with throughout our morning and really over the next, the next few weeks, okay? So how many of you are familiar with the concept of a message in a bottle? Anybody? A lot of us, right? So, so this, is, this is what it, it kind of looks like. I uh, got a little craft kit for today. So uh, um, a message in a bottle is essentially where you write a note, you roll it up, put it in a bottle, throw it into the ocean. You might even seal it with wax. Some people do that. You throw it into the ocean, and you hope that someone somewhere at some random moment is going to find this, right? And so maybe you're stranded and you need help, you know, you're, you're on this, this desert island, you need help, or maybe you've lost touch with some old love interest, and, and, uh, and so the message in a bottle is essentially the last resort, right? The message in a bottle is the, the, the final straw, it, it's, it's the last resort, and so you've tried everything else, you've thought through every other option, and now you're like, okay, I'm going to write a note. I'm going to roll it up, I'm going to place it in a bottle, throw it into the ocean with the hopes that someone on the other side of the ocean is going to read this and come looking for you, right? It's the idea of a message in a bottle. Well, I read an article this last week in The New Yorker from 2017 where Timothy Ferris basically explains that in 1977, the United States created what amounted to be uh, their own sort of message in a bottle moment when NASA launched two identical spacecrafts, both named Voyager, into outer space with the hope of two things. The hope was two things. Number one, scientific discovery about our universe, and number two, the hope of communication. Okay, so this is the Voyager. There was two identical spacecrafts just like this, and each spacecraft uh, carried a golden phonograph record that was mounted to the outside. You can kind of, if you go back one, just one second, you can kind of see it right here, right? The golden phonograph record. Each spacecraft carried that. And uh, you can go to the next uh, just, just for a second. This is what they looked like up close and, and personal. Uh, th- this is uh, what was mounted to the outside. And so, and so each, each spacecraft is carrying this golden record mounted to the outside, and the intent of the golden record was to serve as sort of a time capsule. Right? It's sort of a time capsule with the purpose of communicating with extraterrestrials. And honestly, this is, our, this is our country we love so much. In 1977, right? Okay, so this is what went on. And so they carried, they carried these, these records on them with the hope of communicating with extraterrestrials. So uh, each record was, was carefully constructed. Each record carefully constructed so that, that, so that it would very easily and accurately communicate what life on earth was like to, you know, possible life forms beyond our planet. This is the idea of, of this project that NASA did, right? Two purposes. We're going to learn about our universe and we're going to communicate with extraterrestrials. And this was how they intended to do it, okay? So there was a team of experts and curators that came together to sort of determine the contents of these golden records, and so they had, you know, obviously a, a wide array of information to sort of pare through and figure out and what they were going to use. And, and can you imagine the responsibility? Now, I know the project's kind of weird, and you're going like, well, you're going to communicate with extraterrestrials. But, like, honestly, their task was to comb through all of recorded human history and identify what best defines our collective life. That was their job. Their job was to essentially answer the question, what does it mean to be human? And that's what they did. They went on this, this task. They, they, they worked together. They struggled to agree at times on what to include because they were limited in what they could include on these golden records. And so eventually they settled on some things they agreed upon, like 115 photographs of our planet. Of these photographs, they had a photograph of a woman at a supermarket. They had a photograph of Isaac Newton's page six of the system of the world. They had a photograph of, you know, a father and a daughter, you know, kind of being together. There was even a a picture of uh, gymnast Kathy Rigby uh, on a balance beam. You might remember. Yeah, I don't remember her, but you might. Um, You know, there's uh, uh, all, all these things, a series of photographs about nature and geography and 
in, uh, in science, and then they even included 90 minutes of recordings of, of some of the, the world's greatest music of all time, things from like box prelude, which we hear all the time, you know, at different times of the year, and then, uh, you know, even like uh, Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good. There was just a mixture of songs and a wide array from different cultures, and it was just, it was just crazy, you know, and then they even included, you know, sounds of like an infant crying. They included uh, sounds of like a mother's soothing words. Uh, there, was, there was over 60 human languages included on these uh, records, and, uh, and, and there was uh, like even a whale song included, okay? Just, just interesting. They wanted to kind of cover it all. And, uh, and even a, a, a greeting from the President of the United States at the time, Jimmy Carter. So this is the project. It's an interesting project, isn't it? In fact, both of these satellites, are, are, are spacecrafts, are still in space today. They both have left our solar system. It took them years to leave our solar system. And it is very, very difficult for NASA to even get in touch with them at this point. It takes a long time just to even ping these satellites. And in 2030, uh, this project uh, will come to an end uh, as long as uh, they do not come into touch with extraterr extraterrestrials in that, in that next uh, nine years. So very interesting, and uh, we're dismissed. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I was reading this article, and it really was interesting to me because I began to wonder if you were given the task to illustrate human civilization and to give a definitive description of what life is, what would you include in your golden record? How would you answer the question, what does it mean to be human today? See, I think the answer to this question is likely vastly different than what it would have been like over 40 years ago when this project first began. I mean, so much of life has evolved. So much of the, the, the you know, human race has evolved. Life is just different. And so there's a, probably a series of different answers we could come up with on what does it mean to be human. There's so much nuance to a question like this. But for me, however, one of the many things that I would absolutely include in my definition of what does it mean to be human would be the rise of self-importance and individualism on a global scale that has contributed to uh, this, this quickly becoming the definition of what it means to be human. The rapid rise of individualism, the rapid increase of self-reliance, the rapid increase of self-importance and self-fulfillment, and, and how this has quickly led to a redefining of what it means to be human in 2021. Everywhere we look, like, we see this rise. Everywhere we look, we see this rise in, in, in self-importance. We see this, this rise in individualism. In fact, in fact, if you were to, 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 you know, kind of evaluate how much, like, self-help and how much uh, self-fulfillment has infiltrated, you know, our, our world, I would tell you that, that self-fulfillment is, is probably pretty close to, to, to being maybe the, the, the religion of our lifetime. It is just infiltrated everywhere. That I, I, I'm going to do me. I can handle it myself. I can figure this out. I, all I need is me. It's, it's a cultural rhythm. It's a cultural mindset. It's a cultural belief that has uh, infiltrated every, everything, every aspect of life. If you're taking notes today, I want you to look at this thought with me here today. So much of what it means to be human today is to repeatedly place an abundance of focus and preoccupation with ourselves and the things that affect us at the center of our lives. Our stories have become centered around us rather than God. Everywhere we look, this is what's going on. I think in, I think in many ways, things like self-help and self-fulfillment have defined today what it means to be human. This idea of like, our, our preoccupation and our focus being on ourselves, being so concerned and so focused on, on us and our story and how things affect us. And it's become uh, uh, the very thing that our lives orbit around, ourself. I want to kind of unpack this all morning, and, 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 and I'm going to do that. But what I, what I want to do is just, just kind of take a, a little bit of a detour, and, and you're going to see why in a second. It'll make sense, but it'll feel a little random I want to ask you this question. When you think of the end times, what comes to mind? When you think of the end times, what comes to mind? 
Maybe for some of you, it's like bad Christian movies, right? Uh, like some really bad Christian movies. Maybe, uh, maybe it's like the Antichrist. That's what you think about. If you grew up in a charismatic like, environment like I did, maybe it's like early 90s prophecy conferences about you know, Russia and the European Union or whatever it is. You know, like, anyway, that's more funny for me. But uh, <laughs> I mean, that's, <laughs> but maybe that's you. I think, I think regardless of what your thought is or how you, how, what comes to mind when you think of, of the end times, most of us probably associate the end times with sort of apocalyptic catastrophe. You know, cities burning all around the world, you know, things just melting, you know, it, it's just crazy. And what I wanted to do today is just sort of share with you uh, how the, the Apostle Paul describes the end times. Like, what comes to his mind when he thinks of the end times? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, he says this. He says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. So you and I, we think of the end times and we think of like big cinematic, you know, explosions and fires and like people that look, you know, you know like monsters and, and things you read about in Revelation. And the Apostle Paul, like, he says, this is what I see when I, when I think of the end times. He says there will be terrible times in the last days. And, and the first thing he mentions is he says people will be lovers of themselves. Now, I don't know that I have ever described myself as a lover of myself. Like who, who would do such a thing, right? Really, you need an objective perspective in order to see kind of how self-focused or how, how, how self-centered we become. But it's, it's true in all of us, and this is something that we actually all fight against. Allowing ourselves to sort of sit at the center of our universe, where everything else orbits. John Tyson tells us this, he says, The brokenness, rebellion, family breakdown, lack of civility, and dysfunction in our world stems from this truth. People are lovers of themselves. People are lovers of themselves. So what Tyson's getting at here is he is explaining to us that the cause for the pain and the heartache that we see around us, the, the pain and the heartache that we experience in this world and in our own lives is, is, a part, is from this like ancient destructive force called pride. Pride is when we essentially enthrone ourselves as the ultimate authority and for all intents and purposes worship ourselves while we tell ourselves that we're worshiping God. It's essentially what pride is. And it gets in the way all the time. It usurps God's authority. It takes him essentially off the throne. It places ourselves there. And all the while we're telling ourselves like we're actually worshiping God. When really in many ways we're just, we're just worshiping ourselves. Because we've become the most important thing in our story. We become the most important thing in our mind. I think deep down we all know that we sort of have this propensity to make ourselves the center of our own lives. We do, right? And, and the reality of that is that it is pride. When we sit at the center of our life, when our world revolves around us, pride has crept in. And it's an ancient destructive force that's been around since the beginning of time. Jeff Cook tells us this. He says, pride is not possessing extraordinary talents viewing my skills highly, or even showcasing my gifts for the benefit of others. Pride instead spurs me to view myself as the only one in the entire world who matters. To think that I have somehow earned the prime spot in the universe, and now all of creation is a grand symphony celebrating me. Pride is not thinking too much of myself. Pride is thinking of myself far too much. Far too much. 
And so pride is this thing that, that I think, if we're honest with ourselves, like we all deal with, and some of us maybe at greater levels and, than others, but, it, but it, it, it creeps in. Pride is this thing that, that like baits us, it tempts us to, to, to become consumed and, and, and focused with ourselves. It effectively removes God from the throne and relegates him to a supporting role in our story that we're the ones now writing. You ever, you ever maybe seen yourself in, 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 this, in this way? Maybe you don't like call it pride or whatever, but you ever seen yourself just sort of manhandle the plans of your life? You ever see yourself make, make like significant decisions that you have no business making without first seeking God in prayer? And, and what, what happens is we sort of relegate God to the supporting role and we become the ones who end up writing our story. And, and I don't know if you've ever done something stupid, made a big decision where you, you regretted it, but so often what causes us to do things like this is we, we, we make a decision and we just think, well, well, God, God will help me figure it out, you know? Like, like, he's good, he's a good God, he's a good father, he'll help me, you know, figure it out. And, and that's just pride. That's us just wanting what we want when we want it. And there's refusal to say no to ourselves at times. It's essentially what happened in heaven when Satan expressed his desire to, to be like God. Ultimately, he was kicked out of heaven with a third of heaven's angels. You know, you, you kind of know the story. And what happened there is like Satan wanted to be worshipped like God. He wanted to be worshipped like God. And I think in some ways, so do we. And it's not in like a kingdom with, you know, millions and billions and billions of people, but it's, it's typically within a kingdom of one where we find ourselves essentially worshiping ourself, giving ourselves what we want, giving ourselves what we need. Anton LaVey, founder of the Church of Satan, speaks or says this about Satanism. He says, he says we don't worship Satan. We worship ourselves. Using the metaphorical representation of the qualities of Satan, Satan is the name used by Judeo-Christians for that force of individual, individuality and pride within us. The founder of the Church of Satan, this is what he says. This is what he says. I'm take that in for a second. So what he tells us here is that Satan, Satanists look to Satan as sort of this first authentic rebel who wanted uh, to define his own place in the world. That's, that's, how they, that's how they see Satan. They saw him as this first authentic rebel who sort of rebels against God and wants to define himself his own way in the world. That's, that's how they view Satan. That's how they, they you know, adore him and, and, and you know, affirm him. And what they, what they seek to do is to repl replicate the very same thing. That's their mission. That's their whole purpose of the church of Satan is they want to replicate, replicate the very same thing. So the essence of Satanism, I know it's kind of, kind of weird, like, man, Pastor Jordan, but like, the essence of Satanism is not drinking blood, wearing horns, sacrificing animals. Satanism is the full embrace of the fundamental commitment to taking a seat on the throne of your life. It's the fundamental commitment to taking a seat on the throne of your life. It is the belief that you deserve to be at the center of the known universe, of your known universe. The prideful life is not conformity to the image of God. The prideful life is conformity to the image of Satan. That's who he is. That's what he wants. If you're taking notes today, I gotta, I gotta give you this thought. I want you just to kind of chew on this. It's significant. Determining who will become enthroned upon the heart of one's life may be the primary conflict running throughout all of human history. Determining who will become enthroned upon the heart of one's life may be the primary conflict running throughout all of human history. Now, those of you Jesus people in here, like you could immediately just sort of dismiss some of what we're talking about because you say, well, I'm, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, I've got Jesus in my life. Just because you are saved and headed to heaven and you have you have, you know, allowed Jesus into your life does not guarantee that he sits on the throne of your life. There's a difference between having him as your Savior and having him as your Lord. Big difference. And the primary conflict, not just people out there who don't know Jesus are dealing with, 
But the primary conflict that has been happening within the church for thousands of years has been this thought right here. Who will become enthroned on the heart of one's life? Who will become enthroned on the heart of one's life? Luke chapter 4, I want to share some scriptures with you today. Some scriptures that, that were read to you before we even began. Uh, in, in, uh, there's some powerful truth here in Luke chapter 4. As we see uh, an encounter that Jesus has in the wilderness with Satan. He's drawn into the wilderness immediately after his baptism. And, uh, and after he has received the Holy Spirit, he goes into the wilderness for 40 days before he begins his earthly ministry. And he has this sort of testing period. And in verse 1, it tells us this. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, right? So the dove has just descended upon him at his baptism. The Father speaks from heaven and says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. So he receives the Holy Spirit. It says he left the Jordan. So that's where he was baptized, okay? So this is immediately left the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. I mean, come on, right? Like, thank you. It's nice to know that Jesus even, right, was battling his flesh. And, and uh, I saw that scripture. I was like, we're putting that in during the 21 days of prayer and fasting. So the story goes on here, and it says in verse 5, it says, The devil led him up to a high place, okay? Showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to them, said, said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. Now, before I go on, Jesus doesn't argue with Satan here. Jesus knows that Satan has all authority at this moment. The cross hasn't happened yet, right? Jesus hasn't conquered uh, sin and death. He hasn't risen from the dead. Jesus knows that Satan has all authority. He knows that in Genesis, at the fall of mankind, when God uh, essentially gave Adam and Eve like, like authority, you know, and dominion to subdue the earth, that they, they essentially gave the keys of their authority over to Satan when, when man, man, mankind fell. And Satan had this authority. He was what Scripture calls the prince of the earth. He could do whatever he wanted to do. And Jesus doesn't argue with him here. He knows. And Satan begins to sort of bait him. He begins to tempt him. Because Satan is aware of the mission that Jesus was on when he came to this planet. Jesus' mission, number one, he came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to seek and save those who were lost. He came, he came to be the ultimate sacrifice for you and I, the once and, and final sacrifice on the cross to conquer death, to usher in his kingdom here on earth, to push back the forces of darkness. So all these things, like the enemy knows. That, that, that Jesus essentially came to take back authority from Satan. That's why when, when Jesus ascends into heaven and he gives the Great Commission, he says, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus makes that claim in, in, in Matthew 28, right? He tells his disciples this. He says, it's, all this authority has been given to me. This is after his resurrection. He says, and now I'm giving it to you. So Jesus makes, makes, makes no argument here with, with Satan whatsoever. And he understands what's going on, that Satan is essentially baiting Jesus into cutting a corner. He's saying like, hey, if you would just worship me, if you would just bow down and worship me, that whole thing about going to the cross, dying for all these people, like you don't have to do that. I can just give you the authority now. You can have authority from me now. I'll give it to you. Now, I don't know about you, but like if you've ever gone 40 days without food, if you've ever gone 40 minutes without food, you know that your flesh is, is just raging, isn't it? Jesus is in the desert without food for 40 days. He is weak. His flesh is like raging. And the enemy tempts him to just sort of bypass the process, to skip the cross, and to accept his offer of just receiving the authority from Satan by choosing to bow down and worship him. This is what Jesus says in verse 8. Jesus answered him, 
it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Serve him only. Here's the deal. If Jesus only cared about Jesus, I think he would have taken this offer. If, if Jesus' preferences sat at the center of his life and everything else orbited around it, I think he would have taken this offer. Jesus lived this entirely countercultural way. Like, like his, 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 the thoughts of his father. He says, I only do what I see my, and see my father doing. He says, these are the things that sat at the center of his heart, like in his life. He, he's not going to, you know, drift from those things. And I, I read scripture like this that tells us that, that tells us to worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And I see this response out of Jesus. And, 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 and I think that this is probably the test that we all face, don't we? I mean, we see this sort of like massive sort of cosmic conflict moment in the garden, you know, over in the Middle East, and we're like, it feels a little bit sort of detached from our current day, but, but I think all of us deal with this type of test all the time. Will we worship and serve God, or will we worship ourselves in a kingdom of one? Our stories are intended to be centered around God. Your story and my story is intended to be centered around God. Pride routinely keeps this from happening because pride is not about God, it is about ourself. The way this story ends in Luke 4, you know, is, is interesting. Satan tempts him a couple more times, tries to get him to, to sort of give in. Jesus refuses. You would think that like Satan would just give up because we know that he goes away and he, he, he ends up being like, okay, well, I, just, I can't trick Jesus, I guess, you know, and you think that that would be what happens. But the way this story ends in verse 13, it says, when the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. He didn't, he didn't give up. His commitment wasn't to just, okay, I can't trick Jesus. I'm never going to mess with the guy again. Your enemy is an opportunist. And he's going to look for an opportunity. His commitment here was to go, to leave, and to look for a more opportune time. Maybe when Jesus was more weak. Perhaps when he was suffering on the cross and he was tempted to call down angels to, to, to rescue him. Perhaps in a moment like that. Perhaps when he's being scourged, you know, within an inch of his life. The enemy is an opportunist and he, his commitment was to go and to look for a more opportune time to find Jesus in a more weak moment where he would cave. And this is how he works in your life and in my life. And so your, your spirit might be strong right now. You might be in a hyper sense of uh, season of prayer. You might, you might be connecting with God on a, on, on a great level, but your enemy is an opportunist, which is why we don't take our foot off the pedal, which is why we don't slow down, which is why we don't just give in to our flesh and think it doesn't matter. Because he's an opportunist, and he is going to look for a more opportune time. He's going to look where, for moments where there is, there is a clear crack in the shell. Clear crack in the armor, and he's going to expose it. And this is what he commits to do to us every time. And he tries to bait us into this way where we are entirely focused on ourselves. You deserve that. Don't you? You deserve this. You know? You've been so good. Don't you just deserve a little bit of, you know? He's so good at this. Because when he can get your eyes off of Jesus and your eyes onto yourself, anything can happen. Anything can happen. The worst can happen. If you're taking notes today, look at this with me. Despite the promise of autonomy that our self-centeredness brings, our selfishness actually ends up enslaving us, causing us to collapse inward. Okay? And, and what I mean by this, I really get this thought from, from a quote uh, by Jeff Cook again I want to share with you. And, and, and it's just this. It says, the hellbound do not travel downward, they travel inward. I mean, it, like this was like a showstopper. This was like a, oh my gosh, like when I read this. The hellbound do not travel downward. We think about that, right? People, you know, like... Hell's down there, you know, heaven's up there. That's not, that's not how it goes. That's not where the path is. It's, it's the path of retreating inward. 
of becoming so self-absorbed, of becoming so self-focused, of our, of, of our life really centering around ourselves. And so, and so again, back to this thought, despite the promise of autonomy that our self-centeredness brings, our selfishness actually ends up enslaving us, causing us to collapse inward. This is what happens. Pride's a big deal. And it's not like a, a super you know, fun message necessarily to, to, to speak on. It's critical to evaluate you know, how big of a thing this really is in our lives. And just because I'm a nice person, just because I treat other people with kindness, and I'm not, I'm not rude and I'm not mean, does not mean that I don't struggle with pride. The Bible says in, in 1 Peter 5.5 5, that God opposes the proud. He opposes the proud. The tragedy of pride is that it positions our lives in opposition to the presence and purposes of God. It's the tragedy of pride. I mean, life is hard enough as it is, right? Can you imagine having the God of the universe against you? It's already difficult. It's not easy. But when we live prideful lives or self-centered lives, when everything that happens in this life, we evaluate it on, based on how it affects me, I'm inching pretty close to living a life that, that God is going to struggle with. And I don't want to live in opposition to God. Psalm 138, 6 in the King James says, the proud he knoweth afar off. Okay? So he's not close. He sees him from a distance. Proverbs 8.13 says, God says, I hate pride and arrogance. I hate it. I hate it. Pride turns us away from our created purpose to build and advance the kingdom of God here on earth. And it actually causes us to start worrying about how to build our own kingdoms here on earth. How to accumulate things. How to live lives with absolutely no margin. How to just add things and add things and add things and add things. That's why next week we're going to talk about the freedom of less hurry. Like it has to happen. So many of us, like we have zero margin in our life and we overschedule and we overschedule. And I want to just tell you, just as your pastor in love, that is not the way of Jesus. Not the way of Jesus. And it is a trick. It is a, it is a scheme of the enemy to get us to focus on ourselves and then when we do, anything can happen. Okay, so I've kind of laid, laid the foundation, sort of built this up a little bit. Let me just tell you what the remedy is. As, as I get ready to kind of, kind of close this out today, I want to give you the remedy for sort of this self-centeredness, this self-focus that I think all of us deal with at times. If you're taking notes, the remedy of a self-centered life is self-forgetfulness. Self-forgetfulness. The truly gospel-centered person is not self-centered. The truly gospel-centered person is self-forgetful. Self-forgetful. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Our focus is not upon ourselves. Our focus is on others. Our focus is on Jesus. Our focus is on his kingdom. The remedy to a self-centered life is self-forgetfulness. So often we, we find ourselves just preoccupied and focused on like how things affect us. On, you know, if, if I don't look out for me, who else is going to look out for me? And so often we're quick to take offense when somebody does something because we are so focused on how that makes us feel. How that makes, makes us hurt and the pain and all these things. Well, the remedy, the remedy to this kind of behavior in us, the times where we find ourselves drifting is not to become more focused on our hurt and our pain and, and, and more focused on how to, you know, sort of, sort of power up and defend ourselves. The remedy to these types of things is self-forgetfulness. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It, it's no big deal. Todd White, you know, uh, I've told you this before, he says you, it's impossible to offend a humble man. You can't do it. The remedy to self-centeredness is self-forgetfulness. Tim Keller uh, writes this in, in his book, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. It's a small, tiny little book. You can read it in 30 minutes. I encourage you to go, to go pick it up. He says this. He says, The essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. I just want to, hold on. 
We're not going to go any further. Just let's start, let's start at the beginning. The essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. So it's not having like, 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 a, like a distorted view of yourself. It's not like devaluing yourself or, 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 or whatever, or just being like, yeah, it's okay. People can treat me however they want. I don't care. I mean, it's not about lowering your value or, or, or raising your value. He says the essence of gospel humility is thinking of myself less, less frequently, less often. I'm going I'm to live a life where I'm not as consumed with myself. True gospel humility means I stop connecting, listen to this, every experience, every conversation with myself. In fact, I stop thinking about myself. The freedom of self-forgetfulness, the blessed rest that only self-forgetfulness brings. This is it. There is a freedom that happens when you and I allow ourselves to get to a place where we actually think about ourselves less. There is a liberty that you have, a freeing thing that takes place in your soul when you allow God to bring you to the place where you actually think about yourself less, less often. Because in the Christian life, we, we believe that he cares about us and that he takes care of us. That every need that I have, he'll take care of it. And so my time is spent not thinking about everything I need and everything I gotta do and everything that, you know, that is happening to me in this life. The Christian life is, is, is self-forgetfulness. It's this trust that God is in charge and that, and that he, he's never gonna forget about me and he's gonna take care of every need that I have. That is surrender. That's actually giving my life over, over to him. A really good example of this is in Matthew 26, a really famous place of scripture. Jesus, we find him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's, he's praying through the night, right? And uh, his disciples, three of them, come and, and uh, accompany him into the Garden of Gethsemane, and, G and Jesus is hours from being handed over and betrayed by Judas, he's hours away from being scourged and flogged. He's hours from being crucified. Jesus begins to pray at a level that I, you and I have no idea what this is like. I don't know that you or I have ever reached a level of desperation quite like this. He prayed so intensely that the Bible says he actually sweat drops of blood, which is an actual biological phenomenon that happens. It tells us in verse 39 of Matthew 26, it says, Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. He's asking to not have to go to the cross. He's thinking about, hey, I wonder if he's thinking, about, hey, maybe that shortcut in the wilderness might have not, sounds kind of good right about now. He's asking the father. He says, he says, Father, if it's possible, if there's any other way, if you can accomplish your will any other way, could we, could we talk about that right now? And he comes to this, this last phrase. He just says, he says, yet, or in other translations maybe you're familiar with, nevertheless, he says, not as I will, but as you will. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You see, the key to a, to a life of self-forgetfulness is surrender. The key, you can throw that up there real quick. The three, the, the key to a life of self-surrender, or uh, of self-forgetfulness is surrender. This is the key. Every time pride rises in me, Every time I notice that there's an issue with pride that needs to be dealt with, I'm not living a surrendered life. The key to a life of self-forgetfulness, where I actually live day in and day out, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. The only way to walk that out is to live the surrendered life. Not my will, but yours be done.
refusing to orient my life around my own story. Resisting that temptation and making sure that my life is oriented around the story that God is writing. His kingdom come. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The part I'm supposed to play in that. Most of us, we have no time for that. Most of us, we have no money for that. A lot of us have no interest in that. Because so often we think that like the building of the kingdom of God is reserved for like the elites, the pastors, the missionaries, the evangelists. It's not true. And it's not what the word of God teaches. We are the church and we are the people of God. The Bible tells us that because of the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Okay, so we were that joy set before him. In other words, he had his eye on us and it allowed him to endure the cross. So we were the joy that was set before him and now he is the joy that is set before us. And it was what enables us to endure. It's what enables us to orient our lives around the things that matter. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, it says this. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world if you forfeit your soul? Other translations, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose their soul? Whoever loses their life for me will find it. You see, the way of Jesus is an invitation to find ourselves by losing ourselves. This is the invitation. When Jesus says, come and follow me, wherever you're at in life right now, as you sort of just picture yourself at that sto- in, in that story on the Sea of Galilee as Jesus walks by to the fishermen, asking them to drop their nets to follow him, to become fishers, of men, this is, this is what Jesus is essentially doing to you now, doing to me right now. It's what he's been doing to us for a long time. He brings this invitation. He says, if you really want to find out what life is all about, then go ahead and just lay it down and surrender it to me. Because the way of Jesus is an invitation to find ourselves by losing ourselves. When this kind of humility and this kind of surrender takes over you, and it takes over me, and it starts to take over our church, listen to me, a new kingdom is born. When that becomes our aim, and that becomes our focus, a new kingdom, a new kind of kingdom is born. And it's not the kingdom of self, it's the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, verse 30 tells us this. It says, he must become greater, I must become less. I must become less. Listen to me. There is freedom in the less. There is a burden. There is an additional weight that you and I carry when we don't live this way. Jesus says, come to me, all you, in Matthew 6, come to me, all you who are weary, and burdened. All of you who are heavy laden, he says, and I will give you, what is it? For my yoke is easy and my burden is, my burden's light. So in the first century, 
actually for years prior, a yoke was essentially this piece of wood that set upon the necks of two oxen so that they could plow. It kept them together so that as they were plowing, they would plow straight. That one wouldn't go in this direction and the other in this direction. It kept them straight. Jesus says, he says this, he says, my yoke, the very thing that's around your neck, it's easy. My burden, my burden is light. Oftentimes, we, I think we burden ourselves. We're living in a New Testament salvation with an Old Testament burden. We're not living the abundant life that Jesus says he came to give us. And I hope more than anything in this series, I hope, I hope that there would be a radical reorienting of, reorienting of your life and my life. That you would find just this unburdening taking place. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be so hard. It doesn't have to be so heavy. I think for a lot of people that I have met, a lot of Christians that I've counseled with and been pastors for, I've met a lot of people who love Jesus, but their entire experience of Christianity is that it has been hard. Like, why is this so hard? This isn't an easy yoke. This isn't a light burden. The only way this happens is if you allow your life to become oriented around the things of Jesus and the things that matter most to him. And it will cause you to sacrifice some things that you just, honestly, you don't have time to do those things anyway. You just don't. Because the way you're living your life right now is not the way of Jesus. It's gonna cause you to reorient your life so that who he is and what he brings into you is all that really matters anyway. There is a freedom that we experience as we become less and as he becomes greater. There is a huge paradox of the Christian faith that spiritual growth happens much differently than physical growth. Because to grow physically, you have to increase in size and in stature. You become greater in size, but to grow spiritually, however, it requires us to actually grow smaller. It requires us to decrease, to become less. It's a huge paradox of Scripture. You want to become a greater man of God? You want to become a greater woman of God? You want to have a marriage that's stronger in Jesus? You want to have a home that is marked by the presence of God? You want to shine your light in such a way that it makes a difference in this world? The way you become greater spiritually is by becoming less. Jesus teaches clearly in the Gospels that our faith has to rest on two things. A love for God and a love for people. Like a passion for God and this, this compassion for other people. And so in Matthew 22, and I'm getting ready to close here, it says this. Jesus replied, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus goes on to redefine this. Later on in the Gospels, he redefines this. He doesn't say, he doesn't say, he changes it from loving your neighbor as yourself, which is an Old Testament standard. Instead, what does he say? As I have loved you, so you must love one another. The love of God is intended to lead us out of our internal obsession and into the brokenness and the pain of this world. The love that we have for God is intended to pull us out of this inward focus that we are like so easily drawn into at times. And it's, it's intended to draw us out into the brokenness and the pain of the world and the people around us. Because when we see God clearly, you and I, we see others clearly. When you and I see God correctly and we have an accurate picture it's not a distorted view or image of God. When we see him for who he really is and see him clearly, we actually begin to see other people clearly. So we don't see them as, as, you know, dirty, rotten sinners. We don't see people as like 
evil and corrupt and people we want to stay away from. We don't see people as red or blue, black or white. When we see Jesus clearly, when we see God clearly, then we see other people clearly. And that is when we begin to reorient our lives around those that God desperately seeks to save. It's a whole other kingdom. And the only way anyone can ever enter into the kingdom of God is through humility. It's the antidote to pride. It's the antidote to self-centeredness. We want to embrace self-forgetfulness today. John Tyson says this to close here. He says, humility is not a virtue for the spiritually elite. It is the only appropriate response to seeing who Jesus is and who we are. And in his book here, The Burden is Light, he just made a, he makes a statement, a couple things here I, I want to just read out of the book. It, it's too much to just put it on the screens, but he just says this. He says, in the last days, people may be lovers of themselves, but in the kingdom of God, people become servants of all. So there's a difference. So he goes on and he says, I have a friend named John who's been very successful in the financial services industry. Some of his friends drive expensive cars and own vacation homes in the Hamptons. But John's life has been touched by humility. He drives a Toyota, deploy, deploys vast amounts of his resources for the good of others. Instead of using his spare time on luxury travel and recreation, he teaches the Alpha Course to prison inmates and he mentors younger leaders. In the kingdom of God, people will be lovers of others. He says, Gary Haugen is a well-known founder of the International Justice Mission. He's a living example of humility and deploying one's power for the good of others. He often speaks to crowds of people and receives standing ovations. But when others applaud him, Gary makes a small gesture that may go unnoticed by many. He turns sideways to let the praise and applause symbolically flow past him to the person it truly belongs to, Jesus. At the core of his being, Gary is deploying all he has for the flourishing of others because in the kingdom of God, people will be lovers of others. Ben is a managing director at a large investment bank. Instead of living the high life, he raises money for homeless teens and rallies people to sleep on the streets so they can experience the vulnerabilities these teens face. His wife, Heather, attended Harvard and is a multi-talented writer and consultant. She serves on various boards using her strategic gifts to help nonprofits advance the work of the gospel around the world because in the kingdom of God, people will be lovers of others. My friend Mike is a doctor in New York. Instead of niching his career to serve the most lucrative clients, he runs several walk-in clinics that provide care for some of the most vulnerable people in the city. In the, king in the kingdom of God, People will be lovers of others. He goes on and he says, these kinds of compelling stories of humility are played out in countless ways all over the world, on platforms and playgrounds and classrooms and courtrooms. People are leveraging what they have out of love for others. They are experiencing the freedom of self-forgetfulness and learning from Jesus that he is indeed humble and that his burden is light. Would you stand with me this morning? If you're here today, and you would just say, you know, every head bowed here for a moment, you just say, Pastor Jordan, you know, I just, I just feel, I feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I feel God speaking to me. And I need God's help to begin to live this self-forgetful self life. I need God's help to, to really confront the pride that lives within me. I wanna be set free. 
I need help to begin to reorient my life around the things of God. Could I just see your hand today? I want to pray with you. If you're here today, every head bowed. There's, there's literally hands all over the place. You're not alone. In Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. I pray you'd settle in this room right now. I ask for you to settle in the rooms of every person who is watching online right now, God. Holy Spirit, would you come? And in your great love and in your great gentleness, I ask for you to begin to address the areas in us that need to change. Where there is pride, I pray that it would shrink right now. Where there is strongholds of self-centeredness, strongholds of just self-reliance and doing things our own, own way, God, I pray that these mountains would start to melt like wax in the name of Jesus. We speak to every mountain of pride, every mountain of self-importance here today, every mountain of self-focus that exists in this room right now. We speak to these mountains and we cast them into the sea in Jesus' name. And I pray right now, God, for a supernatural awakening and a quickening to happen in your people. Eyes to see and ears to hear. A brand new focus and a brand new resolve in Jesus' name. I pray for the, the supernatural ability and strength to overcome the rhythms and the flows of culture. The radical decisions being made right now to reorient our lives around the kingdom of God. May you become greater in this room right now. May you become greater right now. And may we become less. Increase, oh God, in this place. Increase in our lives, oh God. Less of us and less of us and less of us and more of you and more of you and more of you. God, I ask that this would be just a, just a, a hallmark moment. I pray that this would be just be a clear moment. We don't want to just do church. We're not interested in just coming and doing church, God. We're not interested in singing a handful of songs and listening to a sermon. We want to follow in the way of Jesus. We want to follow hard after you. We want to let our light shine. And so, God, I pray for an awakening to happen right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. He's waking you up right now. Wake him up, God. Where things, are, where things have been dormant, where things have been untapped and unutilized, I pray for an awakening to happen in our spirit right now. Things that have existed in the background, would you bring them to the foreground in Jesus' name? Every person under the sound of my voice, I just pray for an awakening of our spirit that we would come to attention and allow you to do whatever you want to do with us. Complete and total surrender today in Jesus' name.